So what is imperialism? On the surface, it may seem relatively easy to understand. A big, powerful, evil nation dominates a small, weak, innocent nation. But when we dig deeper, imperialism becomes a complex system to understand. A wide variety of concepts, frameworks, and philosophies are used by different groups of people to understand this system of domination. Here at the Peace Report, we will be using the Marxist tools of dialectical materialism and historical materialism to dig deeper to understand the global system of imperialism in our world today. But understanding how history has unfolded through a materialist lens, using dialectics, we can see that imperialism arrived long before capitalism came into existence and it has taken on different forms throughout different periods. Today, in a world of global capitalism, imperialism has taken on the form of capitalist imperialism. Imperialism is older than capitalism. The Persian, Macedonian, Roman, and Mongol empires all existed centuries before the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. Emperors and conquistadors were interested mostly in plunder and tribute, gold and glory. Capitalist imperialism differs from these earlier forms in the way that it invests in other countries, penetrates cultural and political life, and integrates the overseas economies into an international system of profit accumulation. To understand this more concretely, we will be using the principle of one divides in the two. And the main reason we require an accurate analysis of imperialism is to develop an anti-imperialist movement. Without a strong analysis of imperialism, there is no strong anti-imperialist movement. Welcome to the Peace Report, an anti-imperialist media outlet with the aim of providing accurate analyses of imperialism and updates on anti-imperialist struggles around the world. This channel depends on support from viewers, so please share our content, like our videos, subscribe to this YouTube channel, and if you can go further, become a supporter on Patreon. Sources and more information will always be posted in the description. When studying social systems, dialectical materialism, otherwise known as a component of Marxism, plays an extremely helpful role in interpreting complex social systems such as different productive systems, cultural systems, economic systems, and so on. By using dialectics in interpreting social systems, we learn that all social systems can be divided into two aspects of one contradiction. The capitalist system is divided into the capitalist class and the working class. Imperialism is divided into colonizing nations and colonized nations, and so on. Other contradictions you may have heard before, bourgeoisie versus proletariat, theory versus practice, economic base versus political superstructure, or even productive forces versus relations of production. Many contradictions can be spotted in various societies. The point here is that dialectical materialism becomes very useful in translating our complex world. And although dialectical materialism encompasses laws and guidelines, here, we are specifically focused on one component called the law of contradiction. And another way of saying the law of contradiction is the phrase, one divides in the two. Vladimir Lenin gave us a simple explanation of this principle. The splitting of a single whole and the cognition of its contradictory parts is the essence of dialectics. So let's apply the principle of one divides in the two towards our understanding of the capitalist imperialist system. As briefly mentioned earlier, the capitalist imperialist system itself is divided into two contradictory parts, the oppressor nation and the oppressed nation. But we won't be focusing on this contradiction in this video. Let's focus only on the interpretation of imperialism. When it comes to the interpretation of imperialism, the interpretation itself can be divided into two, a bourgeois interpretation and a Marxist interpretation. 
Now, just briefly, the Marxist interpretation of reality and of social phenomena is the view of the working classes, the poor, and the oppressed. This isn't just straight from Karl Marx. Marxism embodies over a century of theorists from every continent who have contributed to building this philosophy and science in regards to the poor and oppressed and against the capitalists and imperialists. The bourgeois theory of imperialism states that imperialism was the way of the old world, made up of colonialism. It basically says one country dominates another country through force. If anyone in the U.S. has gone to college or a university, the professors often suggest to the students to use either the Oxford Dictionary or the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. So let's see how these dictionaries define imperialism. After all, when most people these days want to learn about something, say, learning about the definition of imperialism, they would do an internet search and these options would certainly pop up in their results. Oxford defines imperialism as a system in which one country controls other countries, often after defeating them in a war. The Merriam-Webster defines imperialism as the policy, practice, or advocacy of extending the power and dominion of a nation, especially by direct territorial acquisitions, or by gaining indirect control over the political or economic life of other areas. Now let's look at how Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines colonialism. Domination of a people or area by a foreign state or nation. The practice of extending and maintaining a nation's political and economic control over another people or area. With these definitions of imperialism and colonialism, there is no difference. It's broad yet similar. They do not provide us any details. What does political and economic control look like? These definitions do not help us understand the actual system of imperialism, the inner workings of the system, the origins of it, how it developed over time into the capitalist imperialist system, or let alone how to deal with it. With the bourgeois interpretation, imperialism doesn't exist anymore. Colonization doesn't exist anymore. In their view, Capitalism developed its way out of colonialism, reaching a new stage of freedom and democracy. And after World War II, U.S. imperialism led the way out of the colonial world, right? Bourgeois interpretations of imperialism usually associate imperialism with past empires. After all, the U.S. ruling classes do not see themselves as an empire completely erasing the history of indigenous genocide, African slavery, colonization of Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and other nations. Colonies became territories, imperialist nations became democracies, imperialist military interventions became issues of national security and maintaining stability, and the oppressed nations became underdeveloped. This description of the history of imperialism is pointless if you are on the receiving end of today's imperialist exploitation, where the colonized continue to be dispossessed, exploited, and subjugated. Philosophy, science, and even history attempts to provide the truth, but Marxists always ask, truth for who, for which class? Painting the history and current system of imperialism as something of the past, one which does not exist anymore, is the truth for the imperialists. Understanding reality in a form that exposes these lies and provides objective reasons why things are the way they are, especially for poor and oppressed peoples, now that is the truth for the people of oppressed nations. This is why the interpretation of reality matters. Our society is not equal, it is divided. This particular point in history is a stage where we can only go in one of two directions. One direction, where the capitalists and imperialists are leading the world towards destruction and planet genocide, or another direction, where the masses of working class people and the oppressed lead the world towards sustainability equality, and justice. How each of us interpret the world either benefits the capitalist direction 
or the direction of the masses of working classes and oppressed. So, what is the interpretation of capitalist imperialism that benefits us towards the correct direction? The Marxist theory of imperialism can help guide us in that direction. The Marxist theory of imperialism refers to a theoretical approach in understanding the development and the expansion of capitalism, mainly the economic motivation behind political and territorial conquest. Marxists understand the distinction between old imperialism and new imperialism, or the different stages of imperialism. Ultimately, Marxists understand that the only constant in the universe is change itself. Everything is in constant motion, evolving, devolving, advancing, retreating, uniting, struggling, opposing, and transforming. Why would the system of imperialism be any different? Before capitalism developed, imperialism was only a system of colonialism. Think about the Roman Empire, founded on slavery using a colonial policy. But capitalism did not begin to develop until the 16th century and the capitalist imperialist system didn't arrive until the late 19th century. So even the United States, while rising during the early capitalist era, founded on indigenous genocide and African slavery, began as the old form of imperialism using colonial policy. But as capitalism developed, the form of this domination and exploitation radically changed by the end of the 19th century. But why? because the way things are produced changed, reaching a higher stage of production. Again, Marxists start with the production in most analyses, what is called the economic base. This is the foundation of society, the way the economic base is structured, how things are produced and distributed, where the wealth goes, and so on. This is the foundation of our analysis. When production changes, the rest of society changes as well. Well, in most cases. Marxists also acknowledge that other aspects of society can have an impact on changing the economic base, but this is for another time to discuss. The point here is that capitalism has a constant need to expand or it'll die. Marx and Engels states this over 170 years ago. The need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the entire surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. It creates a world after its own image. After a few centuries of capitalism continuing to develop, it eventually developed into a higher stage of production, what we call capitalist imperialism. Colonialism still persisted, but production changed in certain ways and continues to develop to new stages. And although Marxists begin with any production in any analysis, the social, cultural, political, and military aspects are also important. This is because the bourgeois interpretation of the world likes to compartmentalize society. Economy is separate from the political, and the political is separate from the cultural, etc. With a Marxist interpretation, all of these are interconnected, interdependent, and have impacts on each other. But we have to start somewhere, and usually it's production. Anthony Brewer states this perfectly in his book, Marxist Theories of Imperialism. The motives for imperial expansion were also predominantly economic. Some historians now seek to deny it, but the men of the East India Company, the Spanish conquistadors, the investors in South African mines, and the slave traders knew very well what they wanted. They wanted to be rich. Colonial empires were exploited ruthlessly as sources of cheap raw materials and cheap labor, and as monopolized markets. The romantic image of empire, flags fluttering over distant outposts and the like, may be appealing but a serious study must concentrate on more fundamental economic issues. This point is fundamental in understanding and interpreting imperialism, because many organizations and individuals who oppose imperialism only oppose it on the basis of political and military interventions, completely or partly ignoring 
the economic side of imperialism. And this economic side is the core aspect of imperialism, especially in this stage of capitalist imperialism. This is why Lenin authored the indispensable pamphlet describing how imperialism developed during the capitalist era, published in 1916, and describes imperialism in the simplest of ways as follows. If it were necessary to give the briefest possible definition of imperialism, we should have to say that imperialism is the monopoly stage of capitalism. In the late 19th century, capitalism developed into a higher stage, what we call capitalist imperialism. This stage is described through five predominant economic features. One, the concentration of production and capital has developed to such a high degree that monopolies play a decisive role in economic life. Two, the merging of bank with industrial capital has created finance capital and a financial oligarchy. Three, the export of capital has developed as distinguished from the export of commodities. Four, international capitalist monopolies have been formed, which share the world among themselves. And five, the whole world is divided among the great imperialist powers. The bourgeois interpretation denies the existence of all of these economic features. They deny monopolies exist, touting the American dream lie that if you work hard enough, you can become a capitalist too. They deny how banks and finance capital have huge influences over production in oppressed nations, who keep these nations in perpetual poverty. They deny the existence of colonies. They deny everything. So as production developed into a higher stage where industrial monopolies began to form, finance capital began to impact daily life, banks became undeniably unavoidable, and capital continued to find infinite resources on a finite planet, then political ramifications began to occur. We saw this as westward expansion continued past the west coast all the way to East Asia. China was carved up like a melon by the U.S. and Western Europe. We saw this in the scramble for Africa in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, where imperialist powers were competing with each other in order to gain a stronger foothold over the continent of Africa. Finally, after the entire world was colonized by imperialist powers, the first inter-imperialist war broke out from 1914 to 1918. One clear example of a bourgeois interpretation of history and of imperialism is how World War I began. We've all been taught, either in high school or at a university, that World War I began with the assassination of the Austrian crown prince, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and his wife Sophie. Really? The assassination of two people is the reason that the world's greatest war at that time began and ended up with millions of deaths? And although many historians discuss in huge detail about what actually happened in the war, how militaries attacked and retreated or what political leaders did and said, they don't discuss the actual causes of these actions and phenomena. While this assassination might have been the spark, it wasn't a cause. To understand the cause, we need to analyze the processes that developed on a world scale in the decades prior to 1914. Without going into too much detail, the causes of the First World War were the economic development of German capitalism and its relation to the established capitalist states of Britain and France, the tangled web of inter-imperialist diplomacy, the struggle for colonies, markets, and spheres of influence in the Third World, ambitions and expansionist tendencies of Tsarist Russia, the wars in the Balkans and the contradictions arising from the decline of the Ottoman Empire, among many other factors. What this means is that the imperialist powers themselves at that time had major contradictions that, according to the logic of capitalism, could only be resolved through the world's greatest war. But yeah, the bourgeois interpretation places history in the hands of a few men 
rather than the social, economic, and political processes of class-divided societies, specifically imperialist nations. All the while, the political leaders at the time had the nerve to call this the war to end all wars. The bourgeoisie call this World War I, Marxists call it the first inter-imperialist war. Just a quick note on the two world wars, we've been indoctrinated by bourgeois thinking when it comes to this history. We've been taught that these wars are called World War I and World War II, almost as if they're separate wars, as if the world is disconnected, where the universal laws of interconnection cease to exist on Earth or with capitalism. But these two world wars are very much connected. Some Marxists call the period between 1914 and 1945 the Thirty Years War, or the First Inter-Imperialist War and the Second Inter-Imperialist War. But why? While there is a lot to say on these issues, just briefly we can say that within the system of imperialism there exists contradictions. We mainly focus on the contradiction between oppressor nations and oppressed nations, but there is also contradictions between the imperialist nations themselves. These contradictions, mainly the battle for greater and greater amounts of capital accumulation, profit theft, land, markets, and the domination of monopolies and finance capital, imperialist nations had to battle it out for greater pieces of the pie. They required more colonies, more territories, more resources, more labor, more markets, all in order to bring more wealth, or super profits, back to their home country. So when we see that some countries like the US, Western Europe, and Japan are wealthier and powerful than the rest of the world, it isn't because they have special abilities, but because they killed, colonized, and exploited the rest of the world. Let's briefly discuss a few tools of imperialism. Colonialism, neocolonialism, and settler colonialism are all tools of imperialism old and new. For one nation to dominate and subjugate another, it requires force. The types of force and the tools required are important. Describing these tools of imperialism and how they play out requires a lot more study, content, and materials, but we may briefly describe them here. Colonialism is a tool of imperialism used to divide and control territories through state violence, usually military, with the aim of circulating finance capital, export capital, and to build cultural, social, economic, political, and military hegemony over a region. Settler colonialism is a specific form of colonialism, where land is seized by the imperialist power, the native people are exterminated by force, and the land is resettled with a foreign, invading population. Neocolonialism is a type of colonialism which is hidden, yet it expands from one colonizing nation to many colonizing nations who colonize together a territory simultaneously, usually by cultural, economic, and subversive means rather than political and military force. Native territories have their own elected political leaders, but these leaders provide a service to the imperialists, not their own people. The wealth that is produced from the economic base is subverted into the hands of the imperialists and towards imperialist nations. There doesn't have to be a colonial government or an occupying foreign military, just the native people betraying their own people for some pocket change. Territorial acquisition is no longer the prevailing imperial mode. In the 19th century and early 20th century, Europeans and North American and Japanese powers carved up the world among themselves. Yet today there is little colonial dominion left. Colonial governments are replaced with men and women in business suits. With this new form of neocolonialism, client states have been established. A client state is one that maintains their own political leadership while being completely open for investments from foreigners on terms that are decidedly in favor of those foreigners. With this client state, a comprador class has developed who may speak of the exploited nation's independence, but ultimately cooperate with the imperialists 
turning their own country into a client state for foreign interests. This comprador class is compensated for its cooperation and enjoys opportunities to fill their pockets with foreign aid. Imperialist armies enjoy the freedom to occupy a foreign land and bring their equipment and training to the client state, only with the reassurance of expanding their own empires, thus making it a capitalist paradise. In the end, colonized nations do not have true independence, whether they are under the hands of colonialism, settler colonialism, or neocolonialism. Of these, the type of colonialism that is least understood and often intentionally ignored is neocolonialism. Why? Well, just like how the bourgeoisie misinformed us on the history of imperialism, they manufacture a reality for us today that avoids the recognition of neocolonialism. Now, the topic of colonialism deserves a video on its own. I would suggest checking out this video produced by Marxist Paul called Colonialism Never Ended. It's a great introductory description of new style colonialism or neocolonialism. In this last point, if we were to take any consideration into the bourgeois interpretation of history, specifically of imperialism, then we must ask some questions. The world is divided into the global north and the global south, sometimes called the first world and the third world, or developed and underdeveloped nations. This division is actually the division between oppressor nations and oppressed nations. These two parts make up a single whole, the imperialist system. So let's ask, why are underdeveloped nations in a state of perpetual underdevelopment? Because it is part of a single system of exploitation and oppression. There is no left without right, rich without poor, imperialist nation without an exploited nation. Third world countries are not underdeveloped, they are overexploited. The third world is richer in resources and should be wealthier than the global north. The imperialists try to justify their interventions, saying the wealthier nations will help uplift the backward nations of the south, bringing them technology and civilization. This is just an updated version of the white man's burden, a favorite imperialist fantasy. The oppressor nation requires an oppressed nation to exist. It's all one system with two opposite parts. With this in mind, we should understand that every dollar that is made in the imperialist nation is a dollar that is taken from the oppressed nation. Che Guevara summarized this exploitative nature of the imperialist system. Ever since monopoly capital took over the world, it has kept the greater part of humanity in poverty, dividing all the profits among the group of the most powerful countries. The standard of living in those countries is based on the extreme poverty of our countries. With this understanding, we should be able to have more disbelief when we hear the imperialist nations or their institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, or the United Nations say that they have the same interests of the underdeveloped countries, that they are working together to rid the world of poverty. The very reason the underdeveloped nations are poor is because they are being oppressed by the imperialist nations, by their tools and their institutions. Massive amounts of wealth are stolen from the oppressed nations, their standards of living never rise, and wealth becomes more concentrated into fewer and fewer hands within the imperialist nations. But the bourgeois interpretation serves the purpose of covering up this international criminal structure, which is why they never use the terms capitalism, imperialism, neocolonialism, and so on. Yet they refer to themselves as liberal democracies. So we must always ask the question, democracy for who? For which class? A government for which class? A military for which class. As long as the bourgeoisie exists, we must combat bourgeois interpretations of history, of imperialism, and of reality itself. And then we can build a militant anti-imperialist movement. And we must always remember the words of France Fanon.
Imperialism leaves behind germs of rot, which we must clinically detect and remove from our land, but from our minds as well. Coffee in the morning, cause revolution ain't no fucking tea party.